More than 30,000 children live in Northern Ireland's most troubled areas. Hundreds of thousands elsewhere in the province live more or less normal lives. But this is the story of the 30,000. It's the story of their life, told mainly as they see it, through their games, their paintings, their songs. It may or may not be the truth, but it's what the children believe, told in their words. Fast in the dark of early morn, British soldiers came marauding, wrecking little homes in scorn. Heedless of the crying children, dragging fathers from their beds, beating sons while helpless mothers watched the blood pour from their head. Armored cars and tanks and guns came to take away our sons, but every man will stand behind the men behind the wires. Not for them the judge and jury, nor indeed a crime at all. Be when Irish means we're guilty, so we're guilty one and all. Round the world and three little tacos, Cromwell's men are here again. England's name again, a solver in the eyes of honest men. Armored cars and tanks and guns came to take away our sons, but every man will stand behind the men behind the wire. For five years now, the boys who will sing that sort of song have lived on the battlefield of guerrilla warfare. At their age, it's hard to remember any other life. Their favourite game is foot patrols. It reenacts the daily routine of a troubled area, searching, questioning, photographing suspects. It also acts out the hatred the children feel. At what age do these games become reality? Is hatred an incurable disease? Even if the troubles do subside, will the troubles end for these children? Perched on the heights above Londonderry is a housing estate whose name has in recent years become notorious throughout the world. This is the Cregan. 15,000 people live on this estate, including 6,000 children. In many ways, it's like all the other overcrowded estates throughout Britain. But the Cregan has one special problem built into its birth. Londonderry has a Catholic majority shown on the dark green areas of the map. But the Protestants, shown as light orange, used to have a majority of seats on the council, and when the Catholic bog side became hopelessly overcrowded, they put the new housing onto the only land available within the same ward. That way they kept control. The result was a ghetto. One set of shops, one factory, virtually no entertainment. Any sociologist could spot a classic environment for vandalism and violence. Yet the local constabulary admit that vandalism didn't come to the Cregan until the Troubles. With the Troubles came the security forces, who applied a tourniquet to Craigavon Bridge, the only road to the bog side in the Cregan. And behind the barricades, the IRA boasted that they ruled Catholic Derry. That was until Motorman, when the army occupied the no-go area and established itself in a camp on Cregan Heights, known locally as Piggery Ridge. This, to Cregan youngsters, is authority. Even a film crew has more contact with these children than the British soldier, who never gets near enough to talk to them, is under orders not to retaliate to provocation, and mutely watches their uncontrolled antagonism. So the soldier sits in the back of his armoured car, frustrated, and photographs the opposition. 
There's a photograph of a minute child. He's probably doing it because he's seen everybody else do it. There's a little girl. She really looks as if she's enjoying it. Uh, she probably is. It's the local cowboys and Indians as far as... Colonel it. Mike Thorne, commander of the 2nd Anglians. Again, a charming, charming face. Doing a very naughty thing there. <laughs> now, there we're getting a bit worse. Uh, young man, probably trying to tempt the soldiers to do something they oughtn't to do. He's got two large bricks in his hand, which, if they're thrown at a soldier, will cause considerable injury. Now, I may say that we've had something like 40 soldiers who've had injuries to their faces or heads of some sort requiring stitches in four months. Now, that young man is quite capable of doing that sort of damage. But, of course, he's too young to be arrested. Uh, he's outside the law, and his parents have... I'm afraid, very little control over him at all, and by and large, they don't believe that they're doing wrong. They don't know they're doing wrong. Um, and there, a good example of a little group um, getting together, waiting for a target to come, be it soldiers on foot or a vehicle. One final photograph of the same group actually in action. The boy in the striped pullover is nine-year-old Paul. By common consent, the best stone thrower in the Lehman Gardens gang. He may or may not have split three soldiers. But there's nothing exceptional about Paul, his brother Pat, or the others. Nothing that is except that they live in the Cregan, in the Troubles, and that Richard has lost his sight. I was up there over Bullock. How did it happen? I was coming up from school up a field, uh, beside the school. <coughs> the field was in an hour school. We were running up, listening, and I, I stopped and I started walking, the rest of them ran away. And I couldn't remember nothing after that. I got 54 stitches in the foot. And uh, I, was, I was only in a hospital for two weeks. But... These kids are playing with death, though they probably don't really understand what it means. It could be the troops firing rubber bullets at rioters, or the crossfire between gunman and soldier. We were stolen the bread skin down mall, and we were in the park, and we got man who up from. We dived the ground. I don't want to say. Paul and Pat were paralysed with fear. When they puck us up, uh, we were all st a stuff. Really? Uh, stiff? Uh, just trying to get there. Probably and then they just shot. pulled us up the same way as we were and dying. And he was just standing beside the gunman. But, but when I was shot, I was uh, the gunman was about uh, just from here, here, they, they, here they pat. To Richard, the crossfire meant contact with his heroes, the provisional gunman. If it hadn't been for another gunman, I, I, I would have been shot. He, he uh, got a hold of me and he, he got me up behind cover and he says he can go ahead now. Last night, we were coming down Broadway and we heard shots. Just before, a second before the shots, we heard talking out the back, out some back. And then we seen flashes and the shots. And we dived in that garden and knocked at the door and someone opened up. Twelve-year-old Joseph as cool as any veteran. What sort of shots were they? Machine gun fire. Machine gun. Can you tell what's happening just from the sound of the guns? Can what you tell what's happening? Uh, uh, the, uh, they, they are ace, really machine gun fire, and, they, and the soldiers is just, uh, you know, SLR. <laughs> you know, they are, you know the, army, the army's gun usually make a crack sound. What sort of sound is that? I don't know what it is. It's like a crack. <laughs> 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 The children know the calibre, action, range of every gun carried by the army or the provisional IRA. Where other kids get their excitement from fantasy or television, these boys have the real thing. They can taunt, stone, harass real live moving targets, and nine times out of ten the soldiers won't retaliate. The excitement worries psychiatrists. It will be hard for such children to settle down to peaceful lives. Yet they live in dull, underfurnished, overcrowded houses. This is where Paul's family lives, 12 of them in all. The house has three bedrooms. I sleep on here. Pat sleeps in it. Or else, Paul. See, I sleep on there and I must sleep down there. Brendan is 14. The brothers have an impressive collection of war trophies. This was a major's swagger stick. I wonder how he lost it. I think it was a long day soldier got shot. An officer who got shot? Mm. A major. To collect stamps or football programmes would be tame compared with rubber bullets. How many rubber bullets have you got between you? About 15, about 17 all the year. Pat, does it worry you when you throw stones and they fire the rubber bullets back at you? 
It worries me sometimes. Every time they fire, I crouch on my knees so it won't tap me. Knee and the net, um, a minute through a stone, it hit the side of the jeep. My feet on the back, and they shot the rubber bullet, and my net pulled me down. And if he hadn't pulled me down, I would have got it in the head. What would have happened if you'd been hit in the head? No. I might have died. When you throw stones, why do you throw them? Because we hit. If you hit the British Army, clap your hands. If you hit the British Army, clap your hands. If you hit the British Army, hit the British Army, hit the British Army, clap your hands. At what age does this hatred start? These are four and five year olds. They've been at school three weeks. As soon as they're left to free activity, they build themselves guns. Small boys and girls in any part of Britain play with toy guns, but not like this. This is obsession. Try and take a gun away from one of these children, and you could have a screaming fit on your hands. The psychiatrists call it identifying with the aggressor. It's what you tend to do when you're afraid. And if your school is in the Cregan, there are plenty of models of the aggressor for you to imitate. Deputy Headmaster Niall McCafferty. I think the five-year-old throw stones simply because it's a, it's a form of play. We played differently when we were five uh, because we had different models, if you like, uh, to copy. Uh, they throw stones because it's the thing that five-year-olds do for fun nowadays. We played cowboys and Indians, they play rioters and uh, soldiers. It's a, a question of learning from, from what they see around them. It takes another year or so of school before teachers like Sheila Doherty can begin to capture the children's attention. Well, they've been in school three years, but generally they're between five and six years old. You're really geographically in the absolute thick of it here, aren't you? Yes, well, this is the main thoroughfare running through Cregan. It's Central Drive. Central Drive is the Cregan's main flashpoint. Whenever there's trouble, rioters swarm over the railings and through the school grounds. These windows here are looking out in the main thoroughfare, and as you can see, most of them are covered up. But before this happened, when anything did begin to happen, the children went to the window to see what was going on. There is a general lack of concentration with the children, and they are so easily distracted from their work anyway. Well, they don't really take it out so much on the wood as by the things that they make out of the wood or by their other work in the classroom. This child is particularly involved uh, because his brother is interned. And so in this book, you know, almost every page has something to do with the trouble. This is not a drawing book? Sorry. This is not a drawing book. This is their news book and their items here. This item is about Anne-Marie's mommy had a new baby girl. And yet the picture is an illustration of what they see around outside school all the time. These are the soldiers. And the writing here is Connor's daddy had to take his car to the garage. And yet, you know, the picture is still about the troubles. It comes out in most of the children at some time or another. What's this? What's this, Daniel? What? Uh, policeman. What's the policeman doing? Stopping all the cars. Why is he stopping the cars? You see their license? Oh, That's very nice, Daniel. Well, Daniel has just said that this is a ferret car and this is uh, the helicopter up in the sky looking down at what's going on in the road. And there's somebody coming along in the bus and the policeman has stopped the bus to look at the man's license before he can drive off. And he wasn't told to do anything about the... About no, the no, this, this, the activities were just put out for the afternoon. Last Christmas, one child painted a crib. When Sheila Doherty asked if the spiky shape above the stable was the star, the child replied, Oh no, miss, that's the helicopter. On another occasion, whenever the children were being prepared for our First Holy Communion, the priest who had come in to talk to them had asked them uh, why Christ had died on the cross, and immediately a hand shot up at the back of the room, you know, and he said, well, why did Christ die on the cross? And he said, he died to save Ireland, Father. The school insulates the children for six hours a day. 
But the troubles are there at the gate, and there again when they get home. There's one main topic of conversation at the family tea table. What the army did this morning. Was anyone lifted or detained? Eight and three thousand pound bail was in that. And uh, whatever happened today, they sent him and his son away to long cash. Two of them? Uh, so all, all the shops are closed in protest over it, isn't that? Every incident wings round the estate, gathering colour as it goes. And because gossip works best under pressure and the estate is so heavily patrolled, rumour is rife. The children's father is unemployed, like many men on the Cregan. Women have usually managed to find work in the shirt factories or cleaning, so Londonderry families tend to be dominated by their mothers. And the propaganda starts young. Teresa is only eight. You told me that they only took a pound out. I'll come and find the pound in his pocket and talk it out on him. Because they see it as helping their cause, the children wreck everything built by authority. The psychiatric description of this behaviour is schizoid. They cut off their noses to spite their faces. They play their football in backyards, not in the playgrounds built by authority. The children see themselves as Hungarian patriots sabotaging the Russian invaders or the French resistance fighting the Nazis. Because they believe that violence has achieved results, they're growing up to admire even the worst forms of violence, like the provisional's traditional method of discipline, putting a gun barrel behind a man's knee and blowing off his kneecap or towering and feathering girls who date soldiers, soldier dolls. They don't really uh, give kneecaps to soldier dolls. As informers, you know, men that they give kneecaps to, they turn fair soldier dolls. They pour Sometimes hot they pour red, pour hot tar and you no know, red tar and all. And red lead and all. And, uh, red lead, that's what I meant to say. And put, you know, throw feathers and all on it. Get a big pile of feathers and throw them on top. I pour it with it. They give my farmers a warning before they shoot them in the knee. Okay. <laughs> Abracadabra and off goes his knee. As we were going over the bridge, the army asked us who we were. As we were going over the bridge, the army asked us who we were. As we were going over the bridge, the army asked us who we were. And we give them an answer. We are the IRA provisionals. We are the provost from both sides. With our rifles and our guns, we will make all enemies run. We're the IRA provisionals from both sides. 10, 11, 12, they can begin to carry a bag with some explosives in it. Um, 13, 14, they can begin to throw things other than stones, the odd blast bomb perhaps. And we've certainly picked up in London, not us as a battalion, but other units have picked up certainly one young man of that sort of age throwing a blast bomb, in fact younger than that actually. And as it, when it comes down to shooting, well, some of the young men, 13, 14, are quite capable physically of firing a pistol if not an arm light, which is a very light weapon. There's another variation of the foot patrols game, which incredibly acts out IRA tactics. To cover the gunman's escape, a line of children rioting. You can't shoot children, can you? There is little doubt that if the terrorist provisional IRA wish to move stuff around, or wish to arrange a situation where they can get the security forces where, for example, they can snipe at them, then they will use the young people 
around the estate to throw stones and perhaps start a riot so that they can get themselves into the position they wish. Because obviously the propaganda to be gained from us shooting a child is enormous. And the sort of scene might be this. And this is an actual scene. About six weeks ago, we could camp up here, gunmen down here, 20 to 30 children tucked in on the road here with a woman. A mobile patrol runs up the hill. And as they go up the hill, they see 20 or 30 little children come out at the bottom of the hill, blocking off the road here. They hear the woman say, out you go. And then, moments later, they hear her say, there's a sniper. Away they go, shot rings out, luckily misses. Soldiers come whizzing back, but the children by then have moved back in the way, so the soldiers can't get through without, of course, injuring a child. <laughs> It's Sunday afternoon on the Cregan, and the children are getting ready for a riot. <laughs> including little Paul and his striped pullover. It could happen any fine Sunday, and if the presence of the film crew makes today a bit special, the soldiers know that on Sunday they stand a good chance of being stoned. But the soldiers have got to make an appearance, or the IRA would organize a riot every Sunday in order to move men and arms around the estate. As winter and perhaps sanity arrives, the rioting dies down. For the squaddy, the soldier on patrol, it is a desperate, dangerous problem. Corporal Waters. If one of them picks a stone up, somebody else will follow, then you get about ten and it builds up a little bit more, and then you get a crowd. We got a bit angry, really, because uh, we came in right at the bottom end of the Cregan. And as soon as we got out, um, my section here, we all got sta they started stoning us straight away. It was about 30 little tiny children started stoning us, and they followed us all the way into the estate. But uh, then they got, they got big, and there's a few big ones there. Let's go! Let's go! Let's go! We got caught there on the corner of that junction. There was a hail of stones came over from the children, and there must have been at least a hundred stones in the air at once. There was that well over, they all came over all at once. By now, the army is cautious. They have spotted a known gunman in the crowd, probably waiting his chance. In a moment, they will use CS gas and rubber bullets to disperse the riot. And the crowd knows it. I got hit on the um, knee, and um, is it Jim here? He got uh, hit on the elbow. His arm went dead for about half an hour, but he was all right. They just hate British soldiers, as far as we, as far as we're concerned. They just tell you that they hate you. The Cregan way of putting it is, I wouldn't give blood to a soldier if he was bleeding to death in front of me. Goodness knows if they mean it, because to say anything else in public is to risk tarring and feathering, or worse. One girl took that risk. I am entitled to give my blood to a soldier if I wish. And as a Christian person, and as this is supposed to be Ireland, the land of saints and scholars, well, I don't know, there are very few saints now, maybe scholars, but I don't think you get many saints in these days of people just couldn't help a dying person. And because his sister has courage, Jim Devenny has a chance of surviving the troubles with a normal mind. By rights, Jim should be more bitter than other Londonderry kids because their father was beaten by the Royal Ulster Constabulary. Unfortunately, when the incident happened, Jim was in the sitting room. And when the police came in the door, they pushed my daddy in the door. And he fell, they had him in the head and actually he fell backwards. And John must have saw that. And then six months after, he died, and another couple of months after that, the house was lost. Eh? We're dealing now with kids who have suffered traumatic experiences. 
The week we left the brow of the hill school, the headmaster was blown up by a landmine left by provisionals in the school grounds. A nine-year-old boy was killed in the same way last February. Even when mines hit their intended targets, the effect on children can be harrowing. Two days before filming, Jim saw a soldier blown up. I seen him flying in the air, landing on the ground again, and the, the woman in the bookies was blown off a chair and her legs was badly damaged. What happened to the soldier? The well, soldier was taken away in an ambulance. His, his, his arm was almost off as well. I just saw his arm was pure red. I couldn't even see the, the skin. It was pure red with blood. You saw it? Mm. How did you feel? And then some people, no, like some people said, started to shoot that, uh, hope he gets another one. I felt sick. I didn't think it was red at all. For boys to talk with compassion about their enemies is a sign of hope for Londonderry. Jim dares because his mother realises what is happening to the children who are encouraged to hate. Hatred doesn't harm the person that you hit. It just harms you. It's you that's going to get all twisted up. That's what's happening to these children. What kind of citizens are they going to be? Even the troubles were over. What's, what's Derry going to be like with these young fellas when they grow up now? Or these young children? Gears are as bad. These, these are going to be mouths and fellas. You know, of the future. And if they have this hatred on them, what in God's name is going to happen to them? Terrible. So Jim can forgive even the men who attacked his father. But it's a confused sort of forgiveness. No, I haven't got nothing against them. That's just what they do. They just kill. These paintings by 14-year-old boys show Londonderry as a confused, deeply paranoid society, producing bemused, bewildered children. Perhaps when the situation allows the troops to leave, the confusion will clear. No one knows. Belfast is a different place. This is the slow march of the Belfast Fianna, the junior branch of the IRA, where the youngsters of the Cregan fought openly and haphazardly against the British army. These are trained, disciplined frontliners in a very different sort of war. God bless my home and the dear old shanko. God bless my homeland and dear old short strand. God bless my God. Shankill is Protestant, short strand is Catholic. The tune's the same, but the children who sing it may never meet because they're on opposite sides of a war. God bless the flag that I lay under, Union Jack, red, white and blue. Red, white and blue represents the loyalist cause. They cheers for the green, white and gold. Green, white and gold is the Irish tricolour. And because the older children hate each other, the younger children suffer terribly. Have you ever heard a really loud bang? Yeah. When was that? What happened? Trevor is seriously disturbed. His father believes he's a victim of the troubles. This was a former petrol station here, and uh, we had a car bomb placed on it. You can see with the new windows had been uh, replacing the old here. Right along the houses here, we had uh, at least 50 houses damaged here with this bomb. What was the effect on Trevor when the car bomb went up? He seemed frightened, like uh, most of the children were frightened with the explosion. Trevor has since been admitted to psychiatric care. He lives at the Protestant end of Roden Street, the light orange area at the bottom of the map. It's a microcosm of troubled Belfast. Catholic ghettos where no Protestant child walks freely. Protestant strongholds where a Catholic school uniform could spell danger. And the children of Belfast are caught in a crossfire. Adrian and Michael are overactive, nervous, disturbed. On Sunday, they were nearly shot. When it hit the door here, the smoke and everything come past the wind. It was that hard. The two children we just made into the hall, lying on their mouths and noses. We were very frightened. The family lives near another sectarian divide, in the Catholic area of Ballymurphy. A few hundred yards away is Protestant Spring Martin, 
and Billy, four years old and heavily sedated. Well, we were just sitting out on the front of the road, overlooking the Catholic areas, and every time they're shooting or sniping, our houses get it. And we've had six windows with bullet holes in them. Will the children of Belfast recover, even if the troubles were to stop soon? No psychiatrist really knows, because no case history quite like this had been written before the troubles. And the first element in the case book is the desolation of the neighbourhood where Trevor grew up. This used to be a thriving community, 75% Protestant, 25% Catholic. This used to be Electric Street, Magnetic Street, Clifford Street, Beatrice Street, Selby Street, Barton Street. Look at it now, just a sheer dumping ground. Jimmy Brown is a Protestant, but he's still prepared to cross the peace line into Catholic Lower Falls. It's one of the worst environments in Belfast. Unbelievable this place here. It's unbelievable that people have to live in conditions like this, including children. Children live in this house here. This other house is occupied. And just around the corner, we have three other houses occupied. This, to my mind, is, as I would say, the Duke of Edinburgh scheme in reverse. This is where children serve their apprenticeship to become vandals. And the psychiatrists agree that this ravaged environment can destroy the mind of a growing child in time. <laughs> the next element in the case book is anxiety. Bullets travel up this street at the Taggart Army Post. Often they miss, like the three that hit Michael and Adrian's front porch last Sunday. The boys were playing in the porch. The bullet went through the door. Michael, I don't know where the way Michael came through the door and then went away over there. The first one when came through the door and threw the door. second one came through the door and the third one just went you know, on. What did you two do? We ran in the house. I did. I got one in. You were first one in. I was. You were standing near the top of the door. Wouldn't. Were you scared? No, I wasn't. Yes, you were. You were in the house screaming. I wasn't. <laughs> you were. I wasn't. Oh, yay! Do you know who does all this shooting? What? Who is it? I know too. Tell him, I know. Who does the shooting? Them ones up there are the Protestants who live on Spring Martin. The bullet holes on the walls tell their own story. They certainly didn't do any shooting last Sunday. In fact, they might easily have been the victims. An IRA sniper in Ballymurphy aiming at the Taggart has only to aim slightly left to hit Adrian and Michael, slightly right, and the victim would be young Billy. Well, if any shooting or any bombing, he's up screaming in the middle of the night or during the day instead of talking till he's screaming at, at me and be asking him to do anything, he screams at me and he, he does a bit of bed wetting. And the doctor's put him on menace now and he'll be on it till he's eight. Told me to keep him on for four years. Well, Adrian has a very bad effect. At the moment, he's on tablets, these are them here. So now he's on these new ones. Doctors don't like prescribing powerful antidepressants to children, yet both Billy and Adrian are on Tofranil. He just goes into these fits and takes the hours working with them to get him out of them. <laughs> and he's more strength than any human being. He would choke you, he would kill you in them. Like, nobody realised there's only us in the house. Like. And he's a loving child, he loves every one of us because after he comes out of the East Hill, he would sit and he would hug and talk to you, you know. He's more man power than anyone else, you know. Even a man, he's more man power than a man. But this really frightens me, that's why I took him to see the doctor, it was frightening me. Joe Hendron is a GP who works in Bally Murphy. I think that the, the outstanding effect on these children is probably indirectly due to their own parents' uh, anxiety and depressions. Uh, the young mother, say with children of that age group, uh, 
oh, I would say two out of every three that I would meet would have a certain amount of depression and uh, tension. Now, the effect of this on, on young children uh, is that they would tend to take it out on them. Mothers complain that their children are very good, but that uh, if they're so irritable themselves that they're beating the children with well, for little reason. The doctor's treating me now that my husband's away. He's treating me for my nerves and he's giving me tablets. And at nights, I don't sleep at all at nights for my husband has never been out of house before. Do you think this communicates itself to Billy? Oh yes, he does. And I, if I'm upset during the day, I take it out on him because he's not doing what I'm telling him. I take it out mostly on him, like. Adrian and Michael have the added tension that their father works on the other side of town. Every day he has to walk a different route for fear of the sectarian murders that plague Belfast. Ten or twelve more of my own patients have been assassinated. And uh, that means that in, in the area, in the evenings um, especially, uh, when there's less traffic, uh, people are afraid. Uh, as darkness comes on, you'll find as people walk along the street, they're looking to their left and right, looking for the shadow in, in, in the doorway. And so the anxiety builds up. When we filmed, Michael had seemed a normal enough child. But the constant fear and that shooting have since taken their toll. Now he too is on Tofranil. Psychiatrists believe that children should receive clinical attention rather than tranquilizers, but the kids simply don't go to clinics. The prescription of tranquilizers has shot up threefold since the trouble started, and nobody knows just how many children are drugged to the point of apathy, nor what the long-term effects of this might be. Some psychiatrists, on the other hand, argue that suicides have gone down, and so has the number of serious psychological breakdowns, which is what you'd expect in a wartime situation where children find an outlet for aggression not normally given them in peacetime. These Protestant children have hijacked a beer lorry and used it to blockade the main Newtonards Road in East Belfast. Until recently, these streets were terrorized by Tartan gangs. Now their place is taken by these youngsters, acting in the name of the loyalist cause. But to remind us that their behavior is modeled on the Tartans, they've kept the old war cry, Newtons, Newtons. In the disco, they dance to it, hi-ho, young Newtons. Newtonards Road has a disco, which is something for a troubled area. But you still can't forget there's a war on. It's organized by the UDA, the Paramilitary Ulster Defense Association, and the dancing has a martial look about it. Here, in loyalist country, children are encouraged to see aggressive behavior as patriotic. Two journalists who studied over 200 sectarian murders came to the conclusion that three quarters of the killings were committed by Protestants, many of them young. East Belfast is almost solid Protestant. A close-knit bundle of streets as devoid of facilities as the Cregan, where youngsters play their football on pavements and learn delinquency in the conventional classroom of alleyways and street corners. Billy is one such youngster. He is 15 and very much a product of this environment. His parents have lost their grip. Oh, so I can't control me. Why not? Just, I just don't do what they, just don't do what they tell me. Why not? I just give me by. They tell me to do something. I just don't do it. Billy doesn't respect school either. The worst schools in this part of East Belfast have a 15% absenteeism rate and a bad vandalism problem. One school was burnt three times last year by the same boy. 
He didn't like school. Billy feels the same way. Any particular reason? No particular reason, just don't like it. I don't want to go back yet. Don't how, fancy it. How long is it since you were there? About a month. Sometimes life gets a bit rough at school, doesn't it? For the masters. Yeah. What happened? <laughs> Used to beat them up now. Used to what? Hit them now, beat them up. You beat them up? During <laughs> school, <laughs> The Troubles have provided Billy with justification for his behaviour, the Loyalist cause. His friends, like 19-year-old Jackie, are drawn from older youths, who are already in the UDA, and Billy can't wait to fulfil his main ambition. Join the UDA, go to meetings, go to parades, anything else, anything you're told to do, you do it. And that's it. And whenever you're called on to go anywhere, you must go. How long would you be in the UDA? For good. Do you think that the troops should get out? No. Why not? If the troops went out, it would be a bloodbath. How? Oh. Catholic and Protestants fighting together. Would you be fighting? Yeah. Would you enjoy the fighting? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we are! We are! We are the Belly Boys! We are! We are! We are the Belly Boys! They're up and neck and fling and gets her in the Royal Rock! Tommy Heron was commander of the East Belfast UDA. When he went missing last September, there was Billy on the national newsreels, his black anorak among the paramilitary uniforms, searching for the body. Billy lives not with his own parents, but with Heron's ex bodyguard, a colonel in the UDA, Billy Elliott. And Billy spends as much time as he can at East Belfast UDA headquarters, helping out by answering the phone. Hello, UDA headquarters, Nick Nigel. Is Nat? His UDA connections bring additional danger, because Big Billy is a marked man. Well, I think probably most officers in the UDA are marked men, you know. There's always, you always live in the fear, certainly, of being shot or something, you know. It's my greatest fear is if they would drive past a house and throw a bomb in through the window or something, then the, my wife and children would get it, you know? And possibly by two if he was in. Because you could shut him any time at all. By who? IRA, anybody. Tell me, have you, have you ever handled a gun? I'm the cadets. What are the cadets? Oh, I'm the cadets. What sort of cadets are they? It's something like a, jun something like a junior army. It's we, we train the army cadets to shoot rifles and pistols now. So you know how to handle it? Yeah. It seems incredible that the British Army Cadet Force is still training boys to use 303s and even automatic weapons here in Ulster where these weapons have been used against British soldiers. But they do. With every month of the troubles, the damage done to the minds of children gets worse. How many boys of Billy's age are destined to become killers? The men of violence are breeding more men of violence. And where does it stop? Or is there a killer among these girls? They belong to Kumna Ban, the women's branch of the IRA. The security forces believe that the IRA provisionals are running short of adult gunmen. So they're falling back on the junior IRA. The Londonderry youngsters carry weapons and act as lookouts for gunmen. But some of these children are trained to kill. And the girls are as hard as the boys. The whole of Ballymurphy has turned out for the funeral of Jimmy Bryson, a captain in the Belfast Provisionals. An army officer who had held Bryson described him as a psychopathic murderer, an animal. But to these children, he was a hero, as much as any footballer or pop star. In any other country, this would be a Boy Scout parade. But this is Belfast. It's a vicious circle. The older children are depriving the younger ones of their childhood. Maria lives at the foot of Lower Falls, in a concrete wilderness called Divis Flats. 
Because it's built high at the very point of the great Catholic wedge, Divis is of strategic importance, treated warily by the security forces patrolled by IRA snipers. And because the flimsy walls are no protection against bullets, the residents are caught in frequent crossfire. The worst of the high-rise nightmare, along with the worst the Troubles has to offer. Maria's father. You could be lying dead here. And n nobody would know you were lying dead because you're, you're cut off from everybody when you come into these places. That, that's, this, this is not a home at all. They're really prisons, these. They're known, especially now for the kiddies living on the top. These corridors are the territory of freelance thugs. The claim is that the Fianna rules Divis. They terrorize adults and children alike. And some parents don't know whether their own children belong to the IRA. They've come to Bryson's funeral to see whether they can spot their sons or daughters in the march. They wouldn't dare ask. The Divis family is trying to escape. I was nagging for nine months. Would you like to go back? Yeah. She is going back. She has her schooling over there now. That means if I bring her back home again, she's going to have to go back to her own school. And uh, she gets too nervous when she's here. Two older boys have already been shipped off to England. The family is being torn apart. If peace comes to Northern Ireland, will children who have lived for five years or more in the crossfire of guerrilla warfare Will they ever settle down to normal life as parents, as members of a peaceful community? Is there any cure for a lost childhood? Where we lived before, there used to be a lamppost. And then when I went out and been swinging on it the day long, playing. But not now. She just can't and all the time. And when they're caught in any trouble, such as shooting and explosions the day before it, the next day, you've got to leave them up at school for a couple of weeks till she settles again, you know. Or else it's, Mummy, don't let me go to school, let me stay at home. Mm -hmm. She's just frightened all the time, you know. She's just frightened all the time, you see. She's feared. But as we had a bit of a shooting not so long ago, a couple of weeks ago, she was already in bed now from after seven. And this happened about after nine. She actually jumped up those stairs and run. Jumped over the top of her down, squealing at the top of her voice. And then you've got to give her a tablet. She's on fever barbitone. And I think myself, she's a bit young for fever barbitone. But to be such a young child because I've had them. And I know how they affect you. Mm. But just to be truthful with you, I'd rather, I would, if it was God's will, I'd like it to set for everybody's sake. Not just for the people that live as flats, because there's really nothing left in Northern Ireland. Oh, Ireland is a very funny place, sir. It's a strange and a trouble done. And the Irish are a bloody funny race, sir. Every girl's in the common and lawn. Every doggy has a tray collared ribbon tied firmly to his tail. And I wouldn't be surprised if there'd be an all right and said the man from the Daily Mail down down down. Every bird upon my word is singing travel. I'm a rebel. Every hand you hang is saying hand grenades over there, sir. I declare, sir. And every stock in the farmyard stock goes a triumph for the gale. And I wouldn't be surprised if there'd be an all right and said the man from the Daily Mail down down down. The reason to do this program is not in any way to do with nostalgia or uh, ego. It's just that I think there's a body of work there that 